So hello, thank you, uh, thank you everyone for coming to the first, uh, you know, series, first seminar of the online math, the online graduate undergraduate mathematical physics seminar at Rutgers University. Uh, today we are joined by Philip Duell, um, a postdoc at Rutgers, who will be giving a talk about a homological approach to path integration. So without further ado, take it away. Okay, thanks Larry for the uh, introduction here and thanks for organizing this and, and inviting me. I'm excited to proselytize a little bit for the uh, sort of alternative approaches to integration that I've learned in the in the last few years. So I guess we should just uh, get, get to it. So the basic overview is I'm gonna make some historical remarks um, and then we're gonna do, I mean, it's gonna be mostly just about examples. So at first I'm gonna introduce a lot of sort of machinery, a lot of algebraic machinery for how this is gonna go. Um, so if people are a little intimidated by that, don't fret too much because we're gonna do two big examples by the end of the talk that'll hopefully uh, bring everything together um, in the sense that it'll sort of come full circle with regard to the historical comments at the beginning. Okay, so the first probably like most important thing that motivates um, what we're gonna talk about today is that in the 1940s, when Dick Feynman was coming up with his methods for doing computations in quantum electrodynamics, um, he noticed that there's a particular object that, that, that um, when computed, gives you probabilities or transition amplitudes, as they were called, um, in, in the theory. So if your dynamical variable is, we're going to call it phi here, and the space of all fields is uh, curly F, then one object that would be nice to compute, um, at least heuristically use it um, to compute, is you integrate over the entire space of all of the fields, right? And you integrate this particular, against this particular measure here, the exponential of, of i times s of phi, where s of phi is the action functional from Lagrangian mechanics or Lagrangian field theory, over this parameter h bar. h bar might be uh, familiar to those of you that have learned a little bit of quantum mechanics. It's like the fundamental constant of quantum mechanics, uh, d phi. Um, so the first thing to notice immediately is that this object is not well-defined, even remotely. Um, not even, even if you fix particular fields or anything like this, this object is not well-defined because the fields F are almost always infinite dimensional. So if this is a finite dimensional integral, um, then it looks kind of like a Gaussian, except there's an I instead of a negative sign. And then you could extract some information and it's relatively rigorous. But if it's infinite dimensional, this is just absolute um, Michigas. And indeed, Freeman Dyson, uh, a famous uh, physicist, told Feynman that he was completely insane for even suggesting this kind of thing. Um, and Feynman was kind of crazy in a lot of senses, actually. Um, but he was he was onto something. Um, he was onto something when it comes to to you know to compute expectation values. You want to compute integrals of functions against particularly relevant measures. This is something that we know from basic probability theory. The only issue is that when you're integrating against these measures on infinite dimensional spaces, this, this really gets out of hand very quickly. Um, okay. So, so I'm gonna make a few more remarks here. Um, well, before I, I don't wanna to move too quickly, uh, please tell me if I am moving too quickly, does anyone have any questions? Okay, if no one does, then I'll, then I'll move on. But if you do have questions, please just start speaking. I think that's probably the easiest way on Zoom to, um, to, field, to field inquiries. Okay, so as a recap for a few and for others, maybe this is something new. There's something called the stationary phase approximation, right? That's concerned with computing these kind of integrals um, where here we're now just integrating over the real line. I'm just gonna try to keep it simple. So if you integrate a function g of x against the measure e to the i f of x over h bar dx, then as you take h bar very, very, very small, um, you get an asymptotic expansion, an asymptotic I would call approximation to this integral that's just a sum. Um, so you look at the critical values of f, f here is the function that's in the exponential. And as h bar gets very, very small, this integral becomes a usually, I mean, ideally a finite sum over the critical values of f um, of this quantity here. And then there's a little bit of little o of h bar to the one half, which we don't need to worry about. The most important chunk is, is this one here. 
So it's a little complicated to write down, but it's not too insane, right? You, you evaluate G at the critical points of F, and then you have some re remainders here that depend on the Hessian of F. Of course, in one dimension, it's just the absolute value of the second derivative, right? But you can take the absolute value of the Hessian of F, you know, the, sec the sort of the broadest second derivative more generally. Um, this is a really, really nice approximation if H bar is very, very small. Um, so what I'm trying to say here is that there's a bit of a salvage. So if the path integral from the previous slide has a finite dimensional critical set, right? So, so critical set for S, I'm going to go back here, right? So S here is a function of the phi. The critical set of S is what we would call in classical physics, the, the, um, the functions that satisfy the euler Lagrange equations associated with S. And they're, they're often, not always, but often finite dimensional. Certainly if you have an elliptic partial, partial differential operator on a compact space, then the, the, um, the solution set will be finite dimensional. Sometimes up to gauge invariance, whatever that means, don't worry about it for now. Um, all I wanna say is that if the, the critical set of the action functional is finite dimensional, um, and sometimes even if it's not finite dimensional, you'll be able to extract meaningful data from that heuristic object on the previous slide by taking the sort of formal parameter h bar to be small. Okay, um, that's what was noticed back then in the forties when, pe when people started doing path integration. It was sort of the way they were able to like explain away the fact that all the mathematicians were raising alarms and raising red flags and saying like, this is not a well-defined object. But they could at least explain it away by saying, oh, stationary phase, finite dimensional um, critical set, whatever. Of course, it's all very wishy-washy, um, and that's why our sort of goal is to try to make it to try to make it um, rigorous, right? So the way that people like me try to make it rigorous is by saying, okay, how do we think of integration? Integration is a functional that takes a density on a manifold and spits out a number, right? You 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 uh, you take a top form, a density, whatever you want to call it, a measure on on, on uh, your manifold, you feed it to the elongated S that we call the integral sine and it spits out a number, right? Let's try to figure out some alternative for this. Okay. Uh, Philip? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so on the last slide, I was wondering if you could uh, just provide some sort of intuition on why, what's, what's the importance of the fact that X zero is in the critical points of F? Like how does the derivative of F being zero at that location, how does that play in to? Oh, um, I mean, to provide intuition, yeah, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really be able to do that. I think um, maybe, maybe someone else would be able maybe to provide I can some help a little bit. Sure, just to think about uh, this is an oscillating integral. It's an integral where the uh, that expression e to the i f of x. It's rapidly oscillating when h bar is small, right? So if you have an integral that when the integrand is rapidly oscillating, there, there is a lot of cancellation, mm -hmm. right? So you will the least amount of cancellation will come when the phase is not varying. So that's why if the phase is this, the slowest varying place for f yeah. for the phase, will give you the maximum contribution. Yeah. So that's how, that's why it's called a stationary phase. So the phase, where phase is stationary, you expect the biggest contribution to the integral. Yeah. That's and, and basically the, the yeah. idea, right? Yeah, thanks, Shani. That's put very well. Yeah, thank you. Okay, any other uh, questions? So perhaps if I take that intuition and I want to apply it to QFT, then what we'd be saying is, you know, when we're computing these probability amplitudes, we expect, we hope that, yeah, you know, we're trying to integrate over this infinite dimensional set, but maybe, you know, in some limit, you know, up to some approximation, maybe actually the contributions of everything but a finite dimensional subspace actually contributes to the integral. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And even even if there's not a finite dimensional 
subspace, um, the situation can be salvaged. I just, I'm saying it here because in the sort of ideal situation, it's a finite dimensional critical set. Um, this is sort of like, um, actually what, what, what Shadi said is like a sharper way of what kind of how Feynman explained it is he said, okay, like the, the thing along the, along the classical trajectory, um, gives the highest contribution. And then if you have some sort of, there's a non-zero probability that the particle takes the non-classical trajectory, but it gets canceled by, by like the opposite trajectory, whatever that means. Right. So this, this, what, this was the wisdom. And then um, as time went forward, you know, we could say it more and more precisely and rigorously, um, even though fundamentally the path integral is still not a well-defined object. I mean, it is under like super special circumstances, but we can maybe talk about that after because right now we're going to take a turn uh, towards reworking integration in like a completely homological sense. And then we'll come back to these integrals at the very end. Yeah, I think, okay. uh, that Larry, one way to, to look at it is that F in this, uh, in this slide is actually going to be the action functional. Yeah. The critical points of the action functional are the classical solutions to the theory. So therefore, exactly. it says that the main contribution is coming from the classical solution. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But there's actually more information here because you can also say something about the next term. And, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's ends up being important. Right. Exactly. Like in, okay. in, in QFT, the more terms you can include in this, in this asymptotic expansion, technically the better. Right. Of course, there's also the issue of convergence of the asymptotic expansion. And of course, it's, it's, it's often, people assume that a lot of these expansions actually don't converge as series in H bar. And that's another issue. Um, they're, they're all sort of related to each other, but yeah. Okay. So now we're gonna do a little bit of um, more just straightforward mathematics, right? And, and, and if people have any questions, please do, please do let me know because we're gonna be throwing a lot of uh, stuff on here. Okay. So let M be an N-dimensional manifold and suppose we have a function S um, a smooth function on the manifold. Okay. Then you can apply the Durand differential to S um, or just, just if you want the ordinary differential uh, like the exterior derivative on S and you get a one form. So the way that I'm writing one forms here is sections of the cotangent bundle. But if you choose coordinates, it's not so scary of an object, right? If you choose coordinates X1 through Xn, you just have um, the X1 derivative of S dx1 plus all the way down to the xn derivative of s dxn. Okay. Uh, this is now this is now a one form on your manifold. If you have a vector field on your manifold, a section of the tangent bundle, you can pair it with a one form field um, to get a smooth function on your manifold. Right. So an arbitrary vector field in the same coordinates is just you know the first component del x1, where del x1 is the x1 differential operator, right, all the way through vn del xn. And if, if, if you pair a one form in a vector field, you get, you get, um, sorry, a one form field in a vector field, you get a smooth function. Okay. So what happens here is that we have a map. We have a map, uh, yoda sub ds, that takes a vector field and it, um, it, 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 evaluates it along the one form ds. Um, you could do this for an arbitrary, you can do this for an arbitrary one form, call it alpha, but the one form that I'm interested in here is ds, um, where s is a smooth function. You'll see why this is relevant later because the, the fact that the function s has a critical set, which is a subspace of n, becomes eventually relevant. Uh, although we're going to do it in just the one dimensional case later on. Um, yeah, okay. So you feed it a vector field, you contract with ds, and you get a smooth function in the way that we said here. But you can you can keep going up with this. So for example, instead of sections of the tangent bundle, you can take symmetric powers of um, the tangent bundle. In other words, an element of this would be uh, a vector field V and a vector field W. If you take V wedge W, then just abstractly get 
you know, that that particular, I wouldn't really call it a two form here. It, it would just be a symmetric, um, sorry, an anti-symmetric function on cotangent, on cotangent fields. So V wedge W and then Yoda DS just acts on one component. So you evaluate V along DS and then you get now a vector field W with new coefficients coming from the fact that you've evaluated V along DS. Okay. And you can keep going up and up with this. Generally, we get this thing called a cochain complex, which in degree zero is just smooth functions. In degree, this is now degree negative one, not one. In degree negative one is vector fields. And then there's this differential contraction with DS that uh, sends you down to smooth functions. You get anti-symmetric, um, second anti-symmetric powers of, of vector fields in degree negative two, and contracting with DS sends you, sends you down to vector fields. And you can work all the way up to um, nth anti-symmetric powers of vector fields. And again, contracting with just the one form sends you actually up in a degree, but down towards um, smooth functions at the very end. And there's a formula from differential topology or differential geometry, I would say differential topology that says that the square of this, in other words, if you, if you contract with DS and then you contract with DS in another component, this is actually zero. And it's because of the, it's because of the anti-symmetry. So contracting with the one form twice uh, is zero. In other words, this thing is a proper coaching complex. So for those of you who haven't heard of the definition of Cochin complex before, it is a list of vector spaces connected by this thing called a differential. And if you move through the differential twice and that's zero, then you have a Cochin complex. Uh, Philip, is this, yeah, go ahead. Yes, when we're applying this map, we're only, um, we're, you know, we're only applying DS to like the first, um, the first thing in the wedge product, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Exactly. I mean, you could just like, as long as you're consistent with your choice, it's fine. So you could like say, oh, it's the second one, right? But as long as you're the second one all the way down, um, yeah, it's fine. It's yeah, fine. unless it's like, unless you're at literally gamma of TM. But like, right, exactly. In yeah. which case, there's no choice. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well said. Well said. Okay. Sweet. So we call this thing, uh, this, this coaching complex, the poly vector fields for M. Poly vector fields, I think, is a fine name, right? It's, it's just anti-symmetric products of vector fields. So they're poly vector fields. Fine. Um, what's interesting is if the differential of S, this thing from up here, if that's zero, the differential of S is zero. In other words, we're satisfying something like, again, in the classical physics, we'd say we're satisfying some equation of motion, some, some classical trajectory. Um, in other words, if we're on shell, then all of these maps are zero, right? Because DS is zero and contracting with zero on a linear map gives you zero. So then all you're left with is just this list of vector spaces and all the maps between them are zero. So it's still, um, it's still actually a Cochin complex because if you have the zero map and then you follow with the zero map, that's the zero map, right? Um, so so it's, it's kind of neat that, that away from uh, DS equals zero, you have this non-trivial thing that's a Cochin complex, but at DS equals zero, it's still a Cochin complex, just a little bit more trivially. Okay. Um, so even if DS isn't zero, you have the kernel of, of Yoda D sub S. And this essentially picks up on the poly vector fields, which are zero when evaluated on DS. Yeah, I think Michael has a question. No, I was just waving. So I had. Not... Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine. I had not paid attention to the time, and so I'm late. Sorry. I see. No problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Thanks for uh, thanks for joining. Okay. Um, yeah. Although I will say that was the best way of asking for a question because the little the little emoji with the little hand really doesn't do very much. <laughs> um, 
So people should follow Michael's example if you have questions. Um, anyway, so so these poly vector fields, notice that's what's going on, is the poly vector fields are a sort of, a sort of I would say, extension, like a generalization of smooth functions, right? The smooth functions are up here in degree zero, but then you have all this other stuff in, in different lower degrees um, that, that is supposed to pick up on some sort of interesting information, and in this particular case, picks up on the information of the critical set of the function S, okay? Um, so, so the kernel, in particular, the kernel of Yoda sub DS, um, um, is things that are poly vector fields that are zero when evaluated along that particular one form. Is this okay with everybody? So right now, this is just I'm abstractly setting everything up. Hopefully, um, it'll it'll the relevance and, and the usefulness of this thing will become uh, more clear later on. <clears throat> And of course, um, as an advertisement, I guess I have to advertise for my next talk in November is I will be talking about only this particular thing and how it relates to some fancy thing called the Battalion Vilkovsky formalism, how to use this to actually do classical physics. But for now, I wanna uh, give the motivation from this angle. Um, so for those of you that are not uh, familiar with the Durham complex, this will be an introduction. For those of you that have seen it, it'll be a quick recap. So if instead of poly vector fields, we just take wedge products of the cotangent bundle and we take sections of, of wedge products of the cotangent bundle, we get these things called K-forms. Um, and the standard notation for them is capital omega upper K of M. And it's generated by these objects. So in a fixed degree K, right, we have dx, uh, dxi1 wedge all the way up through dxi k. Um, there's there's k of these dx's, and then you have some smooth function as a coefficient. You take linear combinations of these, and you have k forms on your manifold n. Um, there's a very important operation that sends you up a degree. So if you're in degree k, you go up to degree k plus one using the exterior derivative or the Durham differential, whatever you like, and it squares to zero. Uh, if it's not obvious to you why it squares to zero, I'll just give a quick example, which will hopefully also garner some of our intuition for this. Um, so if you have a smooth function, which coincidentally is a zero form, um, it's also the zeroth poly vector field. So this is very important for us. Then if you compute its uh, Durham differential, you get this sum, the, the, the xi derivative times dxi. And then if you hit this with the Durham differential, you get this sum here. You get dxi wedge dxj summed over ij with these coefficients that are the second, the mixed second derivatives of, um, of f. Does someone want to tell me why this has to be zero? Um, because the wedge product is alternating, so the uh, and also the mixed partials are the same if you switch the variables, so. Exactly, exactly. So the dxi dxj is anti-symmetric, but the coefficients are symmetric. So for everything to match up nicely, this has to be zero, okay? So if you went from omega zero to omega one with d, and then you left omega one to omega two with another uh, uh, d, another exterior differential, this this is zero. And actually to, to, to show that d squares to zero more broadly, um, you start at omega k, then go up to omega k plus two, you basically just invoke this argument iteratively. Um, so this is, I would say, the most important case. Okay, great. Thanks for uh, thanks for the uh, answer there. Is everyone okay with this or do we have any questions? All right. So, so far, uh, you've probably been, been able to tell, I've been, I've been setting everything up in, in, in purely sort of uh, algebraic language to talk about integration, right? So all of these things like exterior differential and then eventually integration, it's all defined analytically with limits and stuff like this. But then what we're trying to do is extract the algebraic essence so that when um, things are not well-defined in terms of analysis, we can at least see how one might extract valuable information um, algebraically. Of course, in a perfect world, everything would also be uh, defined rigorously with analysis. Maybe someday. Um, 
Anyway, so for top forms, also known as densities, right? So for an n-fold omega n of n, for a closed oriented and oriented um, n-fold, we have this commutative triangle. So if you take if you take top forms omega n and you integrate them, you get a number. And that's what we do with top forms, right? We integrate them. But you could also compute the cohomology of the Durham complex first um, in degree n. And the 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 Durham, the nth Durham cohomology is all top forms modulo those that come from one lower degree via the Durham differential. And then we have a map from the nth cohomology group into R, which is just um, which is just pairing. Okay, so for example, let's say you have some top form mu whose integral is one and it's greater than zero everywhere. In other words, we're already trying to think about probability measures here, right? Then if you pair the top form M with F mu, uh, I think this should really kind of be, oh no, no, this is fine. Anyway, um, the expectation value of this, right? Because again, this is now a probability measure. The expectation value is abstractly defined. You just pair between the fundamental class of M. If you don't know what that is, don't don't worry about it for now. The fundamental class of M and F mu, and then you you get this thing which we call an expectation value for the observable F, which is just a smooth function on M. Whoops. Okay. So so we we have this already like somewhat algebraic perspective on integration, but there's one very important detail here. The um, this depends on the fact that there's top forms on M. So M here is finite dimensional of dimension N. So it has top forms, right? It's, it's Durham complex terminates at, at the nth degree. This is not the case of M is infinite dimensional. And so you can't just say, ah, the integral is any map from omega N to R that satisfies these properties, right? This would not be well-defined because omega N is not where it ends, okay. So now let's see if the polyvector fields that we defined earlier bias anything. Okay, so if we fix a vector field V, we can contract any top form mu. Mu isn't necessarily a probability measure now, it's just a top form, but uh, 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 we'll, we'll go with it. So we have this contraction operation where you take a mu and you evaluate in the first slot along the vector field V, right? Any top form is an anti-linear function of N vector fields. And this drops you down to degree N minus one, right? The, you have N minus one arguments here that are anti-symmetric. And you could do this at any degree um, to actually, this should be, Yeah, okay, perfect. So remember that that vector fields are poly vector fields in degree one, right? The one poly vector fields, or rather I should have said the negative one poly vector fields here, but I'm using uh, K positive. So we have this contraction. So you give it K vector fields, so you get an N minus K alternating form, okay. And if mu is non-zero, uh, I should have said everywhere, I think. If it's greater than zero everywhere, this is actually an isomorphism of graded vector spaces. So you have the graded vector space of Durham forms and you have the graded vector space of poly vector fields. If mu is non-zero everywhere, it's not, if it's completely non-vanishing, then this is actually an isomorphism of graded vector spaces. Um, this takes a little bit of work to show, but it's not, it's not so terrible. And I think hopefully on the intuitionistic level, it's somewhat believable. Um, but there's one issue left is how do we sort of retrieve the correct, um, the correct differential on the poly vector fields that agrees with the Durham differential on, on the Durham forms, okay? So we have the differential from earlier. If you have DS, you can contract with DS and you get a differential on the poly vector fields. But there's actually a lot, there's a lot of different uh, differentials one can define on the poly vector fields. And they have to do with one's choice of measure, or, or in this case, top form, uh, uh, in, 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 in the um, in the Durham forms. Okay, so let's see how this happens. Uh, here's one spot where I should really reiterate: if you have a question, please ask, because I know uh, there's a lot of yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So this is a little embarrassing, but I'm a little bit 
loss and I think I know where my loss is. So could you just kind of repeat the definition of, of mu and where it's coming from? Uh, because I think I missed that. So yeah, first of all, nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, and second of all, so mu here, I, I defined it earlier on this slide as a top form, but in this slide, I also said that it's integral is a one so that it's a probability measure. We're gonna toss that aside for a minute. Right now, all we want mu uh, to be is a top form. So, and so, so, so an alternating N form on an N dimensional manifold. Okay. Um, and so when you, when you stick in a vector field, right, you get an N minus one form because all you're, all you're doing is evaluating on one slot and then the rest of the slots can do whatever they like. Okay. So now we get this, this, I, I, I call this operation here, like pulling back the differential, right? So you have as graded vector spaces that the Durham complex and the poly vector field complex are the same, but you have this really interesting differential on the uh, Durham complex that we want to sort of uh, get involved, see how it's reflected in the poly vector fields via this contraction map, right? So we do it in the, in the usual way, right? We start in degree K for the poly vector fields. We, we, um, we contract with the, we contract with the uh, measure to get an N minus K form. We move along with the Durham differential. And then because um, this is an isomorphism, this iota sub mu is an isomorphism of graded vector spaces, we can take the inverse to go back down to the poly vector fields, okay? So poly vector fields in degree K, we contract with mu to get omega n minus k. We ride along with the Durand differential, and then we contract, or we do the reverse contraction with the measure to come down to poly vector fields in degree k minus one. So I put this in parentheses because ultimately this, this map here, this uh, yoda, in, uh, yoda inverse d yoda is from PVK to PVK minus one, but this, this, uh, this uh, thing that we're doing in the middle is of course very important. And this is how the Durham differential might get reflected as a differential in the poly vector fields. Okay. And uh, Philip, you're saying that uh, the I sub mu has an inverse because mu is nowhere zero. Nowhere That's zero. Assumption. Yeah. Nowhere yeah. zero. I should have said nowhere as zero. No zero. Not just yeah, that it has it's no not zeros. dead zero, but it's nowhere zero. Right. Nowhere zero. Yeah, it's nowhere zero. Yeah, absolutely. So, should I think so? So. So something that this gives me the same vibe as is like the Hodge star operator. Um, should I think of this almost like this, this iota mu inverse is kind of almost like a Hodge star, except it's not going from um, omega n minus k plus one to omega k minus one. It's going to these poly vector fields k minus one. Um... I mean, you're, so so your um, your intuition is correct in that it's some sort of like alternative homological operation on these things. The only difference, and I would say probably the real key difference here, right, is that when you're doing the Hodge star, you're fixing a geometry on your manifold, right? The Hodge star is, is defined with respect to some Riemannian or Lorentzian metric, right? And then and then that's how you define it using the original Durham differential. Um, but you are, and then of course you can, you can, you can sort of define the code differential using, you know, star D star, right? Just like here we have Yoda inverse D Yoda. So, so the homological sort of moves are correct, even though the flavor is a little bit different, right? Um, but your, 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 your head's in the right place. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So this uh, yoda inverse d yoda we call the divergence operator for the measure of the, uh, measure mu, and because yoda sub mu is an isomorphism, and because d squares to zero, this divergence operator also squares to zero, and so now it's a differential on the poly vector fields, and I would call it sort of the the reflection or the ghost of the Durham differential on the poly vector fields where the choice here is not in a choice of geometry, like with the Hodge star, but a choice of uh, fixed, um, fixed measure, fixed top form. Okay. But now we have something interesting. Instead of integration being viewed as a map from top forms to R, right? 
we can view integration as a map from smooth functions to R. Now we can kind of view that anyway when we fix a measure, right? With a fixed measure, you can, you can always do this. Um, but the point is that if we don't have a well-defined notion of measure on the space M, let's say when M is infinite dimensional, then we might be able to salvage this poly vector field business um, on, on M, right? Because even though the poly vector fields go down in degree infinitely for an infinite dimensional space, right? The operation of integration is happening in degree zero, not in top degree. Okay. Um, so there, of course, are other issues like in infinite dimensions, what are smooth functions on M, right? There are a few more notions of smooth functions on M than there are in the usual instance um, of finite dimensional manifolds, but, but it's salvageable. And with the right choices, it, it works out fine. But for now, let's, let's, keep, uh, let's keep to finite dimensions because I would say even in finite, finitely many dimensions, this poly vector field business is actually really, um, really pretty clever. So I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you this now. So let's forget for a minute probability and just look at the Lebesgue measure dx on the real line. So in this case, the poly vector fields only have two terms, the term in degree zero and the term in degree negative one. Um, I should warn, by the way, I accidentally used two different notations for the degrees for the poly vector field. So I apologize for that. Um, but essentially the poly vector fields are just smooth functions in degree zero. And then um, the derivative operator in degree negative one with coefficients in smooth functions, right? So something in degree zero is a smooth function on R, something in degree negative one is, is C here. I'm just saying C for, for shorthand notation, so we won't have to write partial sub X every time. Um, this is in degree negative one and just an arbitrary vector field, right? So F dx is an arbitrary element of poly vector fields in degree negative one. So to see what this divergence operator is for the Lebesgue measure dx, uh, let's see what it does to an arbitrary element of PV negative one. So in this case, it's vector fields, right? So um, first we apply Yoda dx. So Yoda dx applied to F partial X is just F because we contract to the del X and the dx. That's just one uh, with this choice of coordinates. And then just F is the survivor. Um, and then we hit it with the differential, right? So, so uh, D of Yoda dx of F dx is DF, which is DF dx with the, um, as the coefficient dx as the generator of one forms. And then we invert the, the, the um, evaluation along dx. And in this case, it just means getting rid of the dx. Okay. So we have so we have df dx here. So we have PV negative one as vector fields, and under this operation, yoda inverse d yoda, or you, you know, we really we should say yoda d yoda inverse, right? Read right from right to left, we get the derivative of f with respect to x. Okay. In other words, the 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 uh, the divergence operator with respect to dx of f t is the derivative with respect to x of f. And so if you would like to write this as a differential operator without reference to what it's eating, you would, you would uh, write it as this second derivative, right? So, so if, if fc goes to um, df dx, then we have first d dxc, so the c goes away, right? Again, you should really think of this in terms of differentiation as an algebraic operation, right? Not in terms of analysis. So the analysis is very important. But here, I, I just want to give this sort of algebraic essence, okay? So the C goes away and we take the der derivative uh, with respect to X, right? So F C gets sent to del X F by this operation. And this thing is often called the BV Laplacian. And we denote it, denote it with the usual symbol for the Laplacian. But it's important to note that it is not the same thing as the, as the Laplacian in the, original, um, in the original sense, right? Um, as the trace of the Hessian or whatever you'd like to call it, right? Um, so so I, I, I sort of feel like I need to apologize for the sake of my entire community for using this choice of notation and choice of name. Um, however, if you go and read the literature, this is what you'll see. So I feel an obligation to tell you about it, right? I guess we've all made a lot of these choices as mathematicians over the centuries. Um, okay. 
So, so just to quickly reiterate, the, the differential on the poly vector fields with respect to the Lebesgue measure, the divergence, is this thing called the BV Laplacian. Okay. Now, let's do a more interesting example. Let's go back to the realm of probability that motivated us to begin with. Let mu be the following measure, normalized to have uh, integral one on the entire real line, right? So if you integrated e to the negative x squared over 2b, you would get that its integral is square root of 2 pi b. So we're going to divide out by square root of 2 pi b. So the uh, integral of mu over the entire real line is, of course, just 1. OK. This is a probability measure, as some of us may know. If you don't, now you know. If, it, if your thing integrates to 1, you're actually doing probability. Um, if you compute the, the, uh, the poly vector fields, it's, it's the same because we're not referencing the measure yet. We're just looking at the sort of spaces of fields, if you'd like. Uh, in degree zero, it's smooth functions. In degree one, it's, uh, it's vector fields. Uh, where, the, where the generating vector field C is, is in degree negative one. In degree negative one, homologically, for those of you that are not familiar with uh, that kind of terminology, don't worry about it for now. So let's compute the divergence operator. Honestly, it's not much harder to compute, right? So the first thing you do is you take an arbitrary element in degree uh, negative one in vector field, so fc, and you hit it with the contraction with, uh, with a mu. So, so basically you, you have fc, the dx and, and the c cancel, and you're left with just f times the uh, Gaussian function here, the normalized Gaussian. Okay. Now we're gonna hit this with the Durand differential it's not so bad, right? You just uh, use the product rule. And uh, here the dx is written clearly because I had to take the derivative of um, the Gaussian, but here the dx is hidden inside of the mu, right? So first it's df dx times mu, then we leave f alone, we have the derivative of the Gaussian. And this is a very, very important thing to take note of. Um, because if, if, we, if we do Yoda inverse, all we do is sort of erase uh, the dx and the Gaussian, right? But, but look at this here. When you take the derivative of the Gaussian, it sort of just sticks around, right? We know that, the, the e to the whatever sticks around. But what pops out? The derivative of the exponent sticks around, right? And the derivative of the exponent gives you the information of the critical set of what is in the exponent, right? So, so if, if you found out where negative x over b is zero, that would be the critical set of negative x squared over 2b, right? And then when, when you see this full picture now, you have one term here, which is df dx, which looks a lot like what was in the last slide, right? So, so in the last slide, under the Lebesgue measure, fc went to df dx. But now under this Gaussian, this normalized Gaussian measure, fc goes to df dx plus f, so f is just kind of hanging out, times the derivative of the exponent. Okay, so if we call what's in the exponent s sub b, where b is the, uh, the parameter that we might be interested in varying, then this divergence now, this divergence operator with respect to this normalized Gaussian is the... Um, it's the BV Laplacian from the last slide, plus contraction with the differential of the exponent. Okay, any, any questions so far? So this is, this, is, this, is one of the, this is one of the key points. As you feed the poly vector fields with their, uh, uh, yeah, you can feed the poly vector fields different measures and the differential with respect to those different measures changes. Okay. And now we have something really, really nice because if we just forget that this BV uh, Laplacian plus the Yoda D sub S comes from a measure, we can make perfect sense of it without any notion of measure in principle. Right, you have this B V Laplacian, which is the derivative with respect to each variable separately. There's 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 the function variable and the variable C, and then you have contraction with the differential of some smooth function. 
Um, and if B is really small, this is this is starting to look a lot like Laplace's method. Laplace's method is just like the the um, it's like stationary phase, but instead of I, you have a negative sign in front of the x squared over two v, right? So so the 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 um, quantities that Feynman was interested in is he would have x squared over two v with an I in front of it, and then B would be h bar, okay. Um, but in this case, uh, it's just it's called Laplace's method, and it says that if you take b to be very very small, uh, the integral that you're computing with this gets concentrated on the um, critical set of what's in the exponent, which in this simple one dimensional case is negative x over b. Well, it's zero, but the critical set is you know the the zero of negative x over b. Okay. So here is a very important expectation value that you can compute using this particular measure is that with that same measure from the previous slide, if you stick in a polynomial vector field, so instead of fc, x to the nc, if you hit that with the divergence operator, in other words, um, um, try to start computing its expectation value, you get this, you get n x to the n minus one minus one over b x to the n plus one. And this corresponds to Wick's lemma. So Wick's lemma says that um, if you compute expectation values of monomials that have even degree against this normalized Gaussian measure, you get um, you get this quantity here. So you get b to the k, where b is that parameter, times 2k double factorial, where this double factorial means the product of all of the odd integers um, starting at starting at uh, 2k minus 1 all the way down to 5, 3, 1. So this is this is an important fact when when you start learning basic sort of uh, probability, continuous probability theory is you expect you compute these moments of x to the 2k, the expectation values of x to the 2k. And 2k double factorial is the number of ways that you can match a set of 2k points. So as long as you have um, an even power, right? Let's say you have x to the fourth, right? So you, you draw four points and you say, okay, how many ways can I, can I match these four points? So you can match them this way, you can match them this way, and you can match them this way, right? You have three ways that you can match four points, and there it is, three times one, right? So your expectation value would be uh, uh, b squared times four. Of course, you could also just do b equals one, and that would be uh, the even even simpler case. Um, and of course, if you try to integrate, let's say, x cubed against the Gaussian, then you're integrating an odd function over r, and so the integral is zero. So anytime you stick an odd monomial in there, it's zero. Anytime you stick an even monomial and compute its expectation value, you get this nice formula. Philip, uh, yeah. input, uh, uh, interruption. Uh, I'm uh, just a little perplexed about the notation 2k double factorial. If I remember from Gradstein and Rizik, uh, they uh, also have 2k double factorial with the even numbers, right? And what you have yeah. right, would in fact be 2k minus one parentheses double factorial. Oh yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so depending, I, I actually, I'm glad you said this because in certain literature, I have seen 2k double factorial to mean 2k minus one all the way down. But then I've also seen 2k minus one double factorial all the way down. And I think I actually prefer that one, Michael, the one that you just mentioned. Um, so I apologize for using this one. I think one of the notes that I read used this one, but you're right, that is obviously the um, the better choice. Yeah, right, okay. So well, sorry about that notational well, difference. It depends how one defines, but historically, uh, of course, a, a 2k double factorial going down in steps of two is just two to the k times uh, and then the k factorial, you know, so that's yeah, right, right. just mm -hmm. uh, mocking it up, uh, even though it doesn't give anything new, really. And right. while uh, the odd number yeah. is something new, no? and so maybe somebody uh, uh, used the, the last bullet point here actually as a definition, no? so that could be, you know, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, right, right. right the right. first time I see that in, in yeah. this. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, goal. thanks for the, yeah, thanks for the, thanks for the comment there. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, there has to be discrepancy in notation because otherwise our lives would be too boring, right? <laughs> there has to be a little <laughs> confusion to keep us at our toes. Uh, okay, so, so, so just sorry that I'm going to go a minute overboard here. 
Um, but just, just to summarize and to give some outlook, right? So we have some measure here, e to the s over h bar, right? Where now I'm, I'm including into s either the negative or the i, okay? And if you use this measure, we see that its divergence operator is this BV Laplacian plus one over H bar contraction with DS, okay? And actually uh, the way that we usually do this is we multiply through by H bar so that we have this Yoda DS and then the BV Laplacian is actually a little perturbation away from that, right? Um, and so, so what's going on here is that Yoda of D sub S tells us about the classical physics. It tells us about the sort of functions on the critical set of some action functional. In other words, fun, you know, observables associated to some, to some fields uh, uh, satisfying the other Lagrange equations. And then if you want to do perturbative quantum field theory in this homological language, all you do is you perturb the differential a little bit, this H bar delta, right? And it's going to tell you how to quote unquote integrate over these field variables. And we know that this integration is nonsense in a lot of cases. But if you do it as a formal homological algebraic computation where you're very, very, um, very careful with your choice of smooth functions and poly vector fields, I should say this takes a lot of functional analysis to do, but it can be done, right? Then, then it's a nice homological replacement um, and sort of a hope for a more rigorous notion of the, of the path integral. This is of course how the QFT becomes relevant. Okay, um, so that's all I have for today. All right, well, that's all on meet ourselves and give Philip a big round of applause. Thank you very much. Why don't uh, Why don't we open the floor to questions? Yeah, can you repeat the first ten minutes that I missed? I'm, I'm, I'm... <laughs> no, actually, I uh... Larry uploads the video. You'll see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, the question I will ask will force him to do that because uh, I want Philip ask have a question about the, your first slide, or was it the second one? Uh, where you had the stationary phase method. Yeah. Uh, so something about this formula confused me because I thought that uh, you uh, maybe maybe it's a typo. I think that uh, the square root should be uh, in the other on the other place. So so you have two pi h bar, and then you have little o of h bar half. H, yeah. And I think that doesn't quite make sense, right? Um, because you want the higher order uh, perturbation. You you want the you want the O thing to contain higher powers of H bar. Yeah, that's true. So I think... and, and also from what the stationary phase method that I remember, the first term actually has the square root. Yeah, I think that was a typo on my part. Sorry about that. Yeah, it might be uh, the. I think the reason the um. I think the reason this typo was written down by me is probably because I translated it. You know, originally there was some like lambda and lambda was very large instead yeah. of h bar and h bar is very small. So that's probably why I made yeah, this exactly. error. You I know, mean, I was usually, copying it down. Usually the formula that you see, if you look up, it says e to the i lambda f of x. Yeah. And then yeah, exactly. the first term the, that you get in the stationary phase method is the square root of lambda in the denominator. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that was, I was just copying over it. Right. I must have made a, must have made a mistake. And then yeah. the, there is even a more careful way of doing it where you can see what the next term is after that. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. And then, mm -hmm. and then there is a correction. So you get the yeah. term of proportional to, uh, if you put it in terms of the lambda thing, it's one over a square root of lambda. Then there is another term that's proportional to one over lambda. And then there is a correction, which is lambda to the minus three halves. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the station. So yeah, it should be, it should be, it should be h bar squared. It should be h bar squared. Yeah, sorry mm -hmm. about that. I think that- But thank uh, you, Shadi, for bringing it up, yeah. I think that Samir has a question. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make sure I was uh, understanding at least a little bit. Um, so in this case, the first, the, the sum term is what arises from like the iota ds. 
Uh, sorry, which uh, which slide here? I want to take. Uh, it I'm sorry, there. the slide the slide that you were just on with the oh. uh, with the the stationary phase approximation with the okay. so the sum here would correspond to the you'd get from the iota ds. Uh, well, uh, it's or, kind of hard to make the. Um, it's kind of hard to make the the sorry, the the connection here, um, but I think. Yeah, so so the Yoda the yeah the Yoda DS is relevant here because uh, it's the it it defines the critical set of F. It would really yeah. be in this case it would be Yoda DF, mm -hmm. right? Um, but then the BV Laplacian. Okay, I don't I don't I don't want to say too much because I think it would take us too far afield. Okay. Um, I think that the way that I have written it down here is kind of hard to make the connection with with. Um, with what we did later later in the talk. The thing that I just wanted to write, I didn't, I wasn't trying to be too rigorous with the stationary phase formula here, because all I wanted to, to sort of suggest with that is that certain integrals mm -hmm. can be approximated by just focusing on the critical set of whatever is in the exponent. Okay. If one of the parameters is taken to be in this case, very small, or in the case of the Lambda, when it's in the numerator to be very large. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Good, good question. By the way, I have uh, two more comments here. Uh, I take a minor uh, objection against the last bullet point. No? So you say it's the most successful physical theory. Uh, well, it depends yeah. on how you define theory. No, it's, 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 a yeah. it's a computational scheme. Yes. Right? Uh, which, yeah. uh, the way that it is handled, uh, which is non-rigorous, but you do as much as you can, and the numbers come out quite well. No? So, and it, yeah. It's not really a theory, but uh, a more serious comment uh, is that uh, you should maybe look at uh, this recent work of uh, Kostin or Video Kostin, and um, I forgot right now the name of his collaborator. He's from uh, maybe Amherst, and uh, so yeah. they are using trans series, which is uh, of course something that. Uh, uh, relies quite a bit on algebra to make sense out of these things, right? And uh, they made quite some progress in these path integral evaluations. So this is uh, really very impressive work, but uh, it's uh, also uh, uh, quite a bit of hard uh, work in terms of calculations. Yeah. This goes yeah. beyond the usual series expansion, but uh, since there is really a very deep algebraic aspect to it. So you may want to take a look at that. No? Yeah, yeah, thank you, Michael. How do you spell this Costin, C-O-S-T-I-N? Yeah, C-O-S-T-I-N, Costin, okay. Ovidio. Ovidio. There are yeah, two yeah. And that's the Ovidio. And uh, so yeah, I can dig out his collaborator also. So this is- Yeah, that'd be great. Great stuff. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's exciting. I like, I like learning about this stuff, yeah. Okay. Well, it's, it's it's interesting because um, you know I'm doing all this algebra, but I mentioned at one point on the talk, and I still really believe this. Like ultimately, I do think you know there, there needs to be some some analytic expression, a rigorous analytic expression of these things, because when we do the analysis, mm -hmm. we're restricting to just a few functions to actually do expectation values of, and we know that in reality, not everything is just x to the n. Right. Um, so, so, so yes, it's very, it's very relevant. And, and I know that I can say it here safely because I'm in the, I'm in the presence of analysts. Um, so, yeah. But yeah, thank you for the, thank you for the advice. Okay.